Okay. All right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our April meeting of the Archaeological Institute of America Jacksonville Society. My name is Nancy Scott. I'm the president of our society and I want to welcome everybody. We're really glad to be here. In Thank you. I'm disappointed that I didn't win the raffle again. Ah, maybe next time, maybe next time. All right, well, I have the pleasure today to introduce to you Dr. Robert Tycott. Um, he's professor of anthropology at the University of South Florida, and he is a world-renowned researcher in the archaeological sciences. So I'm going to talk about obsidian uh, today in the Mediterranean. This is something I've been doing for quite a long time now. Uh, and uh, so just to kind of go over what I'm covering, talk about a little bit about the history of doing these kinds of studies, uh, because they didn't really start until uh, after I was born, not by me, but by others. Uh, I'm going to focus on the four main islands that have obsidian uh, in the Mediterranean. There's none on the mainland there. Uh, and why is it that we actually go and determine the source of obsidian? What is that telling us about the cultures uh, and different time periods uh, that were involved? Uh, because of the great distances that people had to travel uh, or multiple short distances that obsidian was distributed over. So here we have those four islands, all a part of Italy, from the bottom up, Pantelleria, Lipari, Palmarola, and Sardinia. In the Aegean, uh, we have Milos and uh, Yali, and then up in uh, the Carpathians are some additional sources there. This is because being a volcanic product, there's only certain kinds of volcanoes that produce the right kind of lava that cools fast enough to produce obsidian. There's nothing up there in the Northwest or elsewhere. Um, and anyway, I'm gonna be focusing specifically uh, here in the uh, central Mediterranean area. In that central Mediterranean area, we have to consider other things besides obsidian when we're making our interpretations about travel and use and all of those things. Uh, and this starts really with the beginning of agriculture, about 6,000 or so BCE in the central Mediterranean, a little bit earlier than that, in the eastern Mediterranean. And the use of obsidian coincides with this, that is prior to having the agriculture, obsidian in the central Mediterranean was not being used at all. Uh, and so with the introduction of the domesticated animals and plants, pottery and year round settlements, uh, there was no question they went and settled on most of these islands, at least the larger ones. Uh, and so that, but the real issue is that's not when they discovered that obsidian was there. Obsidian is so obvious in some of these places, and we know that there were some uh, Mesolithic or even Upper Paleolithic uh, cases of people visiting these islands and so on. So they knew it existed, they just were not using it prior uh, uh, to the Neolithic. Obsidian artifacts have been found at more than a thousand archeological sites in Italy and adjacent countries, all those little itty bitty dots uh, uh, shown there. I haven't put any dots in Sardinia because that would cover the entire island um, and haven't bothered with the Eastern Mediterranean uh, areas as well. So because there are multiple sources, we need to we not need to know, but we want to know which ones were utilized based on the location of those archeological sites. And there are definitely sites that are close to more than one of these. And we will see in many cases that multiple sources were being used in the same place, but maybe the percentages or proportions of them changed over time. This is a nice looking simple map uh, that came out, I guess, 27 years ago uh, by Owen Williams Thorpe, uh, who had done some of the earlier studies on obsidian. Uh, and this is a, her reconstruction of the general distribution of them. This is based on the analysis of a fairly small number of artifacts. Uh, at that time, give or take in my mind, I'm going to say something like 300 artifacts or so from many, many different sites 
most of them not coming from excavations, but things that were in various museums, in particular in Britain, uh, uh, but also elsewhere. Anyway, um, it was already known that people were on these islands, people were using the obsidian from Sardinia, Palmarola, Pantelleria, uh, and Lipari, uh, but how far did they go, and what kind of quantity and frequency that we really want to see. There's no obsidian sources here in Florida or anywhere in the eastern part of the United States uh, uh, because we don't have the right kind of volcanic uh, circumstances here, anywhere east of the Rockies, in fact. Uh, but what I'm showing you here is specifically what we have there in the central Mediterranean. Most obsidian is black or gray, depends on the transparency, how it actually looks. There's also some that's green in color. Uh, they're in, in very dark green and opaque, so it's not obviously green. Uh, but uh, just looking at the visual and other characteristics of, of obsidian is not enough by itself to tell exactly where it's coming from. Uh, it may help in some ways, uh, and uh, I'll come back to that a little bit later. I'm zooming in here now on the large island of Sardinia. It's about the size of Massachusetts, so it's a long distance to get from one end to the other. Uh, the location of the obsidian source there is inland, whereas in the other three cases, we're dealing with coastal access. This is a question that we have. Is it the people who were living on the island collecting the obsidian and trading it to the mainland and, and elsewhere, or is it people coming from elsewhere coming to these islands, collecting obsidian and going back. That depends on which island we're talking about. Okay. Uh, I've done a geological survey on all four of these islands that had not been done uh, uh, before. Uh, the first one being on Sardinia that I did for my dissertation work and looking at the different outcrops of obsidian. That's because it's not just one volcanic uh, output, but different parts of the same, com uh, the same volcanic complex. And you can see that on the right side with some of those different colors, what I call Sardinia A, Sardinia B, and C, and even some subgroups within there based on their location, but also on the chemical analysis that I've done shows that we can distinguish by analyzing artifacts which specific location they were in fact coming from. Later on, I did the same kind of geological survey on the island of Lipari, just north of Sicily. You can see all the dots and places uh, where uh, we've gone and found obsidian. There's also been recent volcanic activity uh, producing obsidian on Lipari, about 700 or so AD. That was not used, it was not available for use when we talk about in the Stone Age. Uh, uh, and we can actually chemically distinguish between that more recent uh, uh, volcanic events compared with the earlier uh, ones. And we can distinguish between some of these subsources as well. Pantelleria between Sicily and Tunisia also have done this kind of survey. It's very interesting, uh, the different outcrop locations. Uh, there are three different volcanic events over time on the south end uh, of the island, but then there's also what's called the Lago de Venere area. There's a little lake. The, the obsidian is not in the lake proper, but it's right on the hillsides uh, near there. Uh, and there's two different uh, uh, groups there as well. Palmarola, that thing that's on the top is hiding my, uh, if you can make that disappear, the titles for all of the, there we go, okay, so now you can read <clears throat> what I may not remember to say, uh, Palmarola is very small, uh, uninhabited island. There's no fresh water sources there. It's uh, less than a kilometer from one end to the other. Uh, uh, but nevertheless, we've gone and identified two or three different obsidian source groups on that small little island. Uh, and just to, okay. Now when I hit the arrows, it's not moving. Try the mouse. Okay, now after hitting the mouse once, these move on. Okay, so 
So I've shown all four of the uh, obsidian sources here. Okay, I said something before about differences in color and transparency, and whether there's phenocrysts, little crystallines. Uh, material that has formed over the often millions or hundreds of thousands of years since the obsidian was formed. You can see, if you look very, very carefully at the Pantelleria, if it's a real thin edge, you can see that dark green color, probably not on the screen here anyway. Um, and I've also shown the visual aspects of some of those there uh, in Turkey and the Mediterranean and elsewhere. And there are some circumstances where just doing this quick visual assessment may be useful, uh, but really you have to go and do the scientific analysis uh, because there are many sources out there and they had the access in most places to multiple uh, ones of these. In the 50 years that obsidian analyses have been done, a bunch of different analytical methods have been used. I'm not going to go through this kind of list here, uh, but over that time, I've used several of them myself, uh, but I'm going to show you what I'm using now because it's a non-destructive kind of method. Most of those that are being shown here require either drilling or chipping off a piece of the artifact um, and the cost of the instrument, the maintenance of the instrument, uh, the limited number of labs that have that kind uh, of instrument. These are some of the things that have restricted the number of analyses done in the past. But what we have available now is what we call a portable X-ray fluorescence spectrometer, uh, uh, in particular, a handheld one. I just go and I put it in my backpack and bring it on the plane with me going to Europe or elsewhere that I have gone in different continents now uh, with, that, with this machine. Being non-destructive is, of course, useful not just on obsidian, but on many other materials, like all of the pottery samples from Florida that I was testing here yesterday. Uh, but it works on paintings, uh, and uh, there's both cave paintings and as well as fancy ones on the wall. Anyway, there's a whole bunch of other uses for this instrument besides the obsidian. Uh, that I'm talking on today. And so down at the bottom there uh, is just showing the number of analyses that have been done uh, over time. And I am particularly looking at, or I have the numbers there, where it's more than 10 artifacts per site. That's the number I've kind of chosen if you want to compare one site with another. If you only analyze three pieces from one site, and let's say two came from Lipari and one came from Sardinia, and you analyze three from another site, one came from Lipari and two came from Sardinia. You can't make it, you can't draw any kind of conclusions based on those, you know, such small numbers. Uh, and that's really one of the big advantages of doing non-destructive work in most cases on the entire lithic assemblages found at these different archaeological sites. So at this point in time, uh, about 17,000 analyses have been done on obsidian in the central Mediterranean, uh, and I've done about 70% uh, uh, of those. This is what it looks like when we're doing the analysis on the little screen. It shows us the peaks for different elements, and I've gone and labeled those of particular interest, uh, major elements like potassium and calcium and iron, but in particular trace elements like rubidium, strontium, yttrium, zirconium, and niobium. And take a look at those. If I use the mouse, then you can see where I'm pointing over here. Uh, and you can bear, kind of see that there's two analyses, one in blue, one in red, right on top of each other. They're coming from the same source. Here, I've done two artifacts from different sources. And you can see the one is the red has much higher rubidium and strontium uh, uh, values uh, than the other. So it's quite obvious just while doing the analysis that I can go and say, ah, this one is coming from someplace else. But it's by having all of the geological samples that I've collected and analyzed from those different islands to compare with and identify exactly where they were coming from. So this is a basic graph of the data. So I'm not sitting here looking at just the uh, peaks and things, uh, but a ratio of rubidium over ni niobium and strontium over niobium uh, show that we can immediately separate the Milos obsidians in the Eastern Mediterranean, the Carpathian ones in Southeastern Europe, Pantelleria, 
from the others because it's a different kind of magma that's being used there, so just very different values. And then we have Palmarola, Lipari, uh, and also different sort of Sardinian subsources. Just because I'm only using three elements here does not mean that I'm ignoring the other elements that are there. And you can see this when looking at the different subsources. We're kind of zoomed in on the Monte Archi Sardinia ones in the upper left, but then showing iron uh, uh, values and others in looking at Lipari uh, and uh, for, Palm, uh, for Pantelleria and also pa uh, Palmarola, definitely using multiple uh, trace elements there. So at this point in time, with that geological data set and these analyses done on them, it's a fairly straightforward scientific process to simply go and analyze lots of artifacts and determine where they're coming from. And at this point, uh, I've gone and done a very large number of different archaeological sites throughout Italy and also in adjacent countries, Malta, um, uh, Tunisia, uh, uh, Croatia, uh, and, and, and France. Uh, and this is really good because it allows us to compare different geographic areas, different time periods within one of these geographic areas, compare different uh, uh, things uh, 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 throughout. And so that's what I'm going to do now is go into different archaeological sites and geographic areas and just kind of sum up uh, some of the what I think important discoveries uh, that I have made. The very first analyses that I was working on was on that island of Sardinia. Uh, back from my dissertation times. And the most important thing I found was a change over time. At this one site, uh, the Filiestru Cave in the northwestern part of Sardinia, looking at the cardial impressed ware, the early Neolithic period, the uh, left side of the graph going into the Filiestru, Bonoeginu, and Otsieri phases, middle Neolithic and late Neolithic, you can see that over time the Sardinian C subsource became more important, whereas the Sardinian B subsource decreased over time. By looking then at a bunch of other sites, comparing those periods, this was not something just happening uh, at that first site but in fact happening at many of these archeological sites. So here we're looking at all early Neolithic sites from Sardinia, from Corsica, just a bit to the north, some in the archipelago, uh, islands and whatever, and also some in mainland Italy. You can see you get to mainland Italy and there's not just Sardinian obsidian, but also some of the Palmarola uh, and Lipari obsidian as well. I'll co come back to that later, but just look at this compared with the late Neolithic. We had, just like you had seen uh, at that very first site, that there was an increase in the Sardinian C, decrease in the B and the A, and just going back and forth here, you can see that same pattern, that same change over time occurred at many, many uh, of these archeological sites. It's not because they used up all the obsidian from one of the sources and ran out. That's not what it was. This undoubtedly had to do uh, with the organization of access and trade over time. Early Neolithic people in general, we call them egalitarian or whatever. Yes, they had villages, but these were small groups. They did not have warfare. They did not have major competition uh, uh, or whatever. Uh, in many of these places, uh, they even didn't have land ownership or barriers or things where you could go uh, and bring your animals around with you. There were many, many archaeological sites in Sardinia from the very early Neolithic, uh, but still this kind of uh, basic uh, life scale. That changes over time. Uh, what I'm emphasizing here is looking now at southern France and northern Italy. Uh, whereas the Sardinian and some of the other ones that we've seen are there again on the right. And what you can immediately see is that red color, the Sardinian A obsidian, which is not actually red in itself, but uh, there is clearly a selection going on in southern France for that one outcrop of Monte Archi Sardinia, which was not happening in Sardinia or Corsica itself. 
So how and why is this? This immediately has brought up a bunch of different potential interpretations, uh, including, well, maybe the people uh, from southern France made a trip to Sardinia by themselves and went to the Sardinian A outcrop, which is on the west side of Monte Archi, not too, too far from the coastline, whatever. Um, uh, I find that somewhat unlikely on any kind of consistent basis that we see for all of these different archaeological sites uh, in southern France. Uh, but rather, at some point along the way, they were making a selection when the obsidian arrived in southern France or whatever. Oh, we don't want that one. We will only take some of these. And we're trading, giving you whatever some food or whatever kinds of things, clothing. Uh, that's the other big point here, again, is to keep in mind uh, that trade involves things going in both directions. We're not talking about a boat getting loaded up in Sardinia with obsidian and being brought elsewhere and coming back as an empty boat. It's very hard to travel in an empty boat anyway, but th that's not how things were being done. In most cases, we're also talking not about direct delivery from one spot from the actual source area uh, to the archaeological site, but that there were multiple steps involved in there. Certainly, there was travel over water, so that's one part. Uh, but once it arrives on the coast of the other location, it was not people from the boat getting off and traveling inland to other places. And as you have already seen from the general map, Obsidian made it very, very far inland in these places. And so we don't have the kind uh, of political or economic structure uh, that there would have been such long distance overland travel from one middleman uh, to the archaeological site, but what we call a down the line kind of exchange. Okay, looking now at some of the uh, other specific results that we have, focusing on four different tiny islands in between Corsica uh, and northern Italy, and just looking at the little pie charts with the different colors representing uh, the different sources and all here, you can see they're not all the same. Dealing first with the one uh, Capraia, the northernmost of these, it's mostly coming from Sardinia and a whole lot of the SC in the green, uh, the SA in the red, and the SB in the blue, but there's also small amounts coming from Lipari and Palmarola as well. I think of the actual travel routes from these geological sources to get to the archaeological site that we're dealing with. And there's also no question that they hug the coast they, uh, in, in those times. There are no boats preserved anywhere uh, close in age uh, to the time early time periods when obsidian was being used. We don't know what they looked like, whether they were rafts, whether they had sails on them, uh, whether they traveled at all in the winter time with the risks of getting into very cold water if there's an accident, whatever. But we do know that these were sufficient enough that they managed to bring those domesticated cows and pigs and sheep and, and goats to the islands. So these were not like just in a canoe. Uh, uh, either. Um, anyway, um, having these small islands in between Corsica and the mainland, these were stopping places along the general travel routes. Uh, and so it's, in my mind, no surprise, given the proximity of Capraia to Corsica, which is only a small distance from, Cis uh, from Sardinia, that most of the obsidian there is coming from Sardinia because that's where they would have stopped uh, on the way. Uh, looking then uh, at the next one down, Pianosa, same kind of thing. Most of it is the Sardinian obsidian in the green, red, and blue, small amount coming from elsewhere. But then further south, the island of Giglio, what do we see there? Something like 85% from, Pal uh, from uh, uh, Palmarola, and a very small percent then uh, coming from Sardinia. But that's not in a good place where people would have gone from Sardinia to the pen peninsula of Italy uh, because uh, whatever, it's just not in the right location for that. So this was probably headed in the other direction. 
that is a, a boat that was coming up from Palmarola to there, uh, and then maybe a little bit further along. Genutri, also an island not very far uh, from uh, Giglio, does though have mostly Sardinian things. Why is that? Hard to tell is the simple kind of uh, uh, answer we do not know. Um, but we just always have to consider what the actual trade routes were, how much is open water, what season were they going and doing these kinds of things, uh, what else was being transported along with them. Even besides not having the uh, empty vessel coming back in the other direction, obsidian was never the only thing put on one of these boats. You know, the amount that you need for stone tools for mounting on whatever kinds of uh, hafts and things, these are very small pieces. They didn't need to go and be transporting thousands of them uh, during the Neolithic. So these were there along with other materials that were also being transported. And ultimately, we'd like to know what those other things were, but We'll get to uh, uh, that perhaps in the future. Okay, I kind of already showed you uh, uh, the things there in Southern France in the, in the general graph, uh, but here in the pie chart again, you can see how much is dominated specifically by the Sardinian A subsource, which is just not happening uh, in the routes along the way to get there. Jumping a little further east now, same latitude, give or take, but to the northern part of Italy, uh, where we've gone and tested five different uh, sites, four very close to Parma, one a little bit further uh, away, slightly different time periods that these are representing as well, because uh, these are actually from excavation, so we have better chronological uh, control on these. And for starters, Stuff from, a, uh, from Sardinia is not a very big amount at all. In fact, zero at two of those four sites uh, in, in Parma uh, and very tiny percentage uh, in, in, in the other two. These are mostly uh, from uh, 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 Palmarola, mostly from Lipari, but Palmarola, a very significant percentage in three out of the four. Pescale, the fifth site, not very far uh, from uh, Parma, though. What do we see? A lot of the Sardinia A, uh, a lot of Sardinia C, and then Lipari obsidian. So small distance between these two places, but very big difference in which obsidian sources were being utilized. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and we've analyzed plenty of artifacts uh, from all of these sites. So these are not statistical issues in making these kinds of comparisons and things. Time period. And again, what other material was being transported for whatever reason over land as well as over the water to these sources. If you remember from the original map that I showed uh, produced by Williams Thorpe, the distribution of Palmarola obsidian was a very tiny little spot in the middle, showing mostly Lipari uh, and Sardinian obsidian distribution. That turns out simply to just not be the case at all. We have Palmarola obsidian making it all the way uh, to southern France, into Corsica, throughout pretty much all parts uh, of Italy, and even across the Adriatic into Croatia. Uh, so this is why it's important not to just look at visual assessments where, yes, it's a black to gray kind of obsidian, but doing some kind of chemical analysis and being enabled to do this on many, many artifacts because we can do it non-destructively. Uh, the percentages even of the Palmarola obsidian, not just one out of 100 pieces making it as far as southern France or northern Italy or whatever, uh, but the number where it's 40% or more of the actual assemblage, those with the blue arrows pointing to them. So this was just part of that regular travel and exchange that was going on in the Neolithic here on this tiny island of, Pantal of Palmarola where nobody would have been living there year round or anything like that, but you had people on their boats from the mainland coming and visiting Palmarola, collecting obsidian, uh, and then trading it up and down the coast, but also 
than secondary trades and exchanges far inland as well. Uh, and when we're talking about making it uh, to uh, whatever, from the one side of Italy to the other side of Italy, and then on a boat again over the Adriatic, making it to uh, Croatia. Um, I'm showing Isola del Giglio again. I talked about this a little uh, before, but just a little bit of uh, detail here. Uh, the site there is specifically the early Neolithic. So we have a very uh, excavation and so on. Uh, so we have uh, the pottery uh, and the lithic material all studied and so on. And I showed you the graph before that how it is dominated by obsidian coming uh, from uh, Palmarola and giving its location and so on. One of the things that we definitely see is a change over time in the dominance of some of these sources. And Palmarola being the dominant thing here at Isola del Giglio in the early Neolithic, it, there isn't a late Neolithic site on that same island to compare with, but this just says something uh, we think uh, that it would have likely have been different because of what we see at other sites, which are later in time in, in, in that area. Okay, at least we didn't get disconnected. Okay, now heading a little bit further south or more inland at Podra Olivastro. Again, we have the different island sources of obsidian mostly coming from Palmarola and Lipari, but also Sardinia. This is in the middle Neolithic time period. In general, it seems that the Sardinian obsidian was less dominant at greater distances in the early Neolithic, but the middle Neolithic, earlier part of the later Neolithic, it did become a dominant source, certainly over Palmarola and competing basically with Lipari obsidian as we get further east and south and closer to the Lipari source area. And that's what I'm doing right now. We're heading down, looking at sites like Venafro and Montragone, uh, where now we have no Sardinian obsidian, except for a couple of pieces uh, at, at one of these two sites. They're also quite close to Palmarola, so no surprise really that we have uh, a dominance of that uh, at uh, the one site, uh, but even so close to Palmarola, at the other side, it's mostly leapery. And why is this? Uh, it's hard to come up with a specific or conclusive definition uh, of, of this, uh, but we really have to consider what else is being found at these sites besides the obsidian, the pottery, and so on, the exact location. Uh, Mondragone is much closer to the coast uh, than uh, the other site of uh, Venafro. And so that may very well be the reason for this. Uh, and just showing some examples of what were being found. Uh, something I didn't say before is that the production of obsidian tools, you start off with a block of the raw material, you turn it into some kind of core, uh, and then from that you can go and produce lots of blades and flakes. It appears that in almost all cases, those initial um, uh, production part is done very close to the geological source. So what is getting traded are the cores, and then the actual tools are being produced at many of these archaeological sites. And when these have been excavated, we know this because we're finding the debitage, the broken pieces, as well as the, well, the small parts that are left of what was originally a much larger core. Uh, uh, there are some cases where that's not being found. This can you know, be just simply related to the extent of the excavation, or in many cases, uh, simply the collection of surface material uh, uh, at, at some of these sites. Okay. Um, and I guess I'm just showing again um, something about uh, the Palmarola obsidian. And, oh, the, the, these are just different percentages. Uh, and so this is specifically the early Neolithic uh, for Palmarola. Then we have here where it's uh, at least 20%, many, many of those archaeological sites. And I think I showed you the 40% before. Okay. If you remember what Italy looks like on the east side, we have the Adriatic uh, and that little peninsula sticking out with the Gargano 
uh, uh, hills and so on. Anyway, just to the south of the Gargano Peninsula is a major agricultural zone, the Tavoliere. Uh, major, major thing today uh, in producing whatever crops and things, wheat and barley and so on, going back to the very beginnings of the early Neolithic time period. We have gone and done extensive survey of archaeological sites in that area, collecting obsidian and other lithic material that has been found, uh, a lot of chart coming from the Apennines and elsewhere. Anyway, finding obsidian, and you can also see uh, as an example, uh, one of those cores uh, just at one of those sites doing the chemical analyses, and we find that, yes, they're coming from Lipari and uh, Palmarola, not from Pantelleria, which, as I head further south, we'll get to Pantelleria uh, eventually. Uh, and one of the important things here uh, is looking at the Lipari obsidian, and it seems that all of the actual artifacts are coming from one of those geological outcrops called Gavilato. Uh, in Gavilato Gorge. Uh, and whereas the Palmarola material is coming from different subsources. Nice thing here, just showing the Adriatic, you can see uh, the Gargano Peninsula there. There were people who visited and lived on many of these islands there in the Adriatic. And their location in the middle of the Adriatic, north south wise, made it a very easy way to travel from mainland Croatia to mainland Italy. And this was, we think, very important for the initial distribution of the whole Neolithic package, uh, based on excavations being done uh, at sites in Croatia, show that the, the Neolithic began a little bit earlier there than it did in Italy. Also, the dates that we have in Italy show that they're earlier in the southern part of Italy than in the northern part of Italy. It was originally thought that that distribution was all over land. That is, that the Neolithic spreading from the east to the west went to the top of Italy and then down the peninsula, whereas that is definitely not how it was. Uh, and finding the obsidian and other things in between just shows that uh, they were traveling over water uh, with things on these boats besides the obsidian. Okay. The numbers are here just to remind me, the vast majority of this is, is all Lipari obsidian. Again, all coming from Gavilato, none from the other subsource uh, there, uh, which is a Canetto Dentro. A few pieces of Palmarola, having gone from the island in the Tyrrhenian to mainland Italy, then back on uh, the coast uh, in, in the Adriatic, uh, and, and, and to the mainland. Uh, and also some coming from the Carpathian sources because we're getting closer now that, uh, to Southeast uh, uh, Europe. Uh, and in some cases, unusual percentages. Uh, uh, you can see also here on the graph, we have five cases coming all, uh, all the way from Milos in the Aegean. These are from somewhat later period, very end of the Neolithic time period. Uh, uh, and it's just was totally unexpected even for that later time period. And you can see on the graph here where I'm pointing uh, to uh, some of those little bluish samples matching perfectly with the Milo subsources. We know in the Aegean that those islands and things were also being visited and, and occupied uh, in the Neolithic time period. And I'm not showing here, but just the distance from not the Aegean, but from you go a little bit west of Greece into Albania, uh, the distance from Albania to the heel of Italy is not very far. It's not that great a distance over that part of the Adriatic. Why is there not more of this kind of exchange going on? Well, that's a hard question, but it also seems to be the dividing line of what we call the, car the um, cardial and pressed wear phase that I had shown before compared with the Aegean phase of things in the Neolithic, that these were different populations, different general cultures, uh, and it seems that there was relatively little direct exchange going on 
uh, uh, between them. Uh, this is just back showing potential directions of travel over water. They didn't have motorboats then. Okay, how were they going and traveling? We don't know if they even had sails, but certainly the current, the direction of the wind, uh, as well as the current was important. Uh, and so what part of the year was it that the travel was occurring? Maybe very different in other parts of the year. Uh, again, they're certainly having islands and places to at least stop for in between facilitated uh, that kind of travel. Okay. We're now into uh, the um, whatever bottom of peninsular Italy here in Calabria, uh, where a number of sites have also been uh, tested, uh, and some inland, many coastal, and so on. Uh, and let's just see what we have. I also have to just go and thank the various colleagues that I have gone and done a lot of this work with graduate students and otherwise uh, who have helped find in the storage units and the boxes from excavations from who knows when, pulling them out, seeing that uh, in many cases the dust is accumulated on there, and so at least wiping them clean enough to do the analyses, uh, and of course simply to give them some kind of uh, analysis number. You know, you, we just don't go and grab a piece out of a bag, zap it, and then throw it back in the bag again. Uh, uh, so anyway, I, I really uh, uh, thank them uh, uh, for this and just in different places. I can also thank uh, one of my sons uh, who uh, can even operate the machine. And I'm not even showing you this, uh, but he actually started doing that when he was 10 years old uh, and uh, did one of those uh, science projects for uh, his class once. So, okay. Saracena there inland, mountainous, obviously, uh, fairly recent excavation done there, good stratigraphy and all of that inside the cave. Uh, and obsidian was found uh, in, in at least three of the different Neolithic levels that are in there. Um, and I'm looking, and it doesn't actually say on that graph, but uh, probably when I get to this one, I can say something about most of it absolutely being coming from Leapery. And we found one piece out of the 467 that came from that secondary source on Leapery, uh, Canetto Dentro. Uh, but what's most important, at least to me, is that we have obsidian coming from two of the Sardinian subsources and also from Palmarola. And if you look then in the lower graph, this seems to change over time. In the early Neolithic, of course, all of them were dominated by Lepre obsidian, but all of that Palmarola obsidian is in the early Neolithic. None of that in the middle Neolithic. That's when we have the Sardinian stuff. Uh, and so this is because we have some kind of change in the socio-political, socio-economic systems, control of the territories, who is going and actually bringing the stuff from the islands to the mainland and so on. Did I see a hand raised? This is at Saracena, located right there. Okay. Good. Okay. Yep, sure. And out of all of those other sites in Calabria, obsidian from places other than Lipari, this is like almost the unique circumstance. We have one piece all the way from Pantelleria found at one site. And uh, we have at uh, Piani della Corona, uh, Corona uh, a couple, not of other sites, uh, but of the secondary Lipari uh, subsource. So how, why is this the case? There's no way that the obsidian got flown from Sardinia to uh, uh, Saracena. It had to travel over land from the coastal areas inland, but none of those coastal or other sites uh, that at least we have tested, none of them have we ever found any obsidian being left uh, there along the way. Uh, so this is something that we just have to kind of consider what 
are we actually representing here from our preserved or identified archaeological sites? And I will say, I've gone, we've gone and actually analyzed the lithic material from virtually all of the sites where they have kept the archaeological, you know, uh, uh, collections uh, uh, at. So uh, yes, we can go and try and find some more Neolithic sites, go and analyze, you know, what's uh, being found there. Uh, but it's not like it's a selection of which sites uh, we, we've done so far. <coughs> In the course of doing the, this very large number of samples, uh, we found that Sardinian obsidian, not just there at that one site in Calabria, uh, but at a number of other sites in the southern part of Italy, and even uh, at one site in Sicily. And, you know, you kind of ask, why would there be Sardinian obsidian in Sicily, which is so close to Lipari uh, and, and to Pantelleria? The people who were bringing it there, they're not from there. They didn't know what was available. It didn't even really matter what was locally available. They have something already turned from a raw material into at least a core that they would go and exchange for other things to bring back you know, to, to where they came from. So having a few pieces in this kind of exchange system ending up in these places, uh, to me, is not really a surprise. It's because we've gone and analyzed such a large number of artifacts and sites that we have found these. The chances of finding, you know, those three pieces from uh, Sardinia out of the 500 or whatever uh, at uh, uh, Saracena, if we were only analyzing 10 artifacts from that site, pretty good chance we wouldn't have known this. Okay. Zooming in here specifically on Sicily, we've gone and analyzed a very large number of sites, 50 of them being able to analyze at least 10 or more, uh, and finding, no surprise, at least to me, Pantelleria obsidian, especially in the western part of Sicily, which is closer to Pantelleria, uh, than the eastern part, which is closer to Lipari. That doesn't mean that smack in the middle you're going to have 50-50, because there are different properties, different colors, different other things uh, about why people were visiting those source islands. The distance from Pantelleria to Lipari is much more clear open water. We're talking about a good hundred kilometers or so compared to Lipari, uh, where there's also an island in between Lipari and the northernmost part uh, of Sicily, uh, but something on the order of just 20 kilometers. Uh, and also, Lipari was occupied going back to the Neolithic, whereas Pantelleria, there is no evidence of settlement on Pantelleria uh, until the early Copper Age. Okay. To the northwest of Sicily is a tiny island of Ustica, uh, which is not on the way to anywhere else. There's no other, let's say Pantelleria, you would think that's a good place between Sicily and Tunisia uh, and a vary, the various islands that we talked about there in the Tyrrhenian that you're stopping en route from Corsica to mainland Italy or the same thing in the Adriatic. Ustica is the single island that is out there. Nobody was going there as a stopping point to go on to someplace else. Nevertheless, it was also occupied from the early Neolithic time period. And on this island, which is not very big, we've now found uh, at least 10 different archaeological sites there representing different time periods from the early Neolithic through the Bronze Age. Um, and uh, again, what the artifacts look like. Uh, the first, let's say two things here that are, are important. Uh, one is, yes, there's both Lipari and Pantelleria. There does not seem to be a change over time in the relative importance of each of those two geological sources. That in pretty much all the cases, it's between 10 and 20 percent uh, of the obsidian coming from Pantelleria uh, with, with, with no change. Uh, and again, a pretty good number of samples being tested. The route 
that was taken. In the case of Pantelleria, yes, the 100 kilometers to get to the south southwestern part of Sicily could be the same boat continuing along that coastline, maybe with a couple little stops and continuing to Ustica directly uh, or otherwise. One of the questions that we've always had is, let's say for Lipari going to Ustica, did they go the short distance to get to the northern part of Sicily, then along the coast and then straight to Ustica? Or did it go straight from Lipari westward uh, uh, to Ustica? Comparing the percentage of the Pantelleria obsidian versus Lipari found at Ustica with what was found at sites in the northwest part of Sicily strongly supports there being a direct connection from Lipari to Ustica. That is that Lipari obsidian accounting for 80 to 90 percent of the obsidian there at the sites in the northwestern part of Sicily, they were not as high as that, that they had more of the Ustica obsidian. Uh, so I think this really informs us about their maritime capabilities starting there in the early Neolithic, that they were not afraid of going these great distances. I wouldn't be afraid on a nice sunny day in the summer where you can get off the boat, swim in the water, and not get too cold or, or whatever. Uh, we're, it's hard for us to really ever say anything about when they were doing this, you know, were they traveling every month out of the year or nine months or, or you know, some short times kinds of things. But this is something that really needs to be considered, unlike what we have today. OK, the final area that I'm going to talk about now is Malta, a uh, different country, uh, uh, but further south of Sicily, about as the same distance from the southeast part of Sicily as Pantelleria is from the southwestern part. And obsidian has been found now at a number of different sites on both the main island, which is Malta, and the smaller island, which is called Gozo. Uh, and what is really unique is the site of Shara in the middle of Gozo. Uh, and on the mainland, the site of Scorba, there was a major excavation being done back in the early 1960s, but very well recorded and so on. No surprise, most of the obsidian is from Lipari. Some is coming from Pantelleria. Uh, and, uh, and that that was true in different time period phases at this residential and ritual site of Scorba. And whatever, small pieces, also some small cores, they were doing this there. The Brocktorf Circle, which is this, uh, in the area that's called Shara, uh, on, on Gozo. This was rediscovered uh, back in the 1980s. It had actually been known back in the 1800s, but then was covered over and lost. This is a burial complex underground uh, in the limestone, soft kind of rock stuff, where there were all these little tomb chambers and stuff in there. And it was originally the rock over the top. Okay, so you went underground to get into there for the various rituals and other things that were going on. They did a major re-excavation after the rediscovery uh, uh, of this in the 1980s. Um, and I've gone and done the analyses there uh, on the obsidian artifacts that they found. Uh, and comparing the mainland of Malta, the site of Scorba in particular, what did we find? As I showed you, give or take, almost 80% coming from Lipari, about 20% coming from Pantelleria, all of the Lipari obsidian coming uh, from Gabalato, whereas at the site of the Brocktorf Circle, we totally switch things the other way. 77% coming from Pantelleria, 23% from Lipari, again, all coming from uh, uh, Gabalato. We have not found that uh, uh, really anywhere else in all of Italy. What kind of selection or something was going on there at this ritual site of the Brocktorf Circle that they want all Pantelleria obsidian? The distance, you know, these islands are right next to each other, so it has nothing to do with the distance of travel, how much open water, uh, you know, that kind of thing, but this was a specific kind of thing that was going on. Uh, and I'm just showing you here uh, that, yes, we have different 
um, Pantelleria subsources that were being used there, the Balata de Turkey and Lago de Venere uh, uh, groups and things. Uh, but in all cases, it's mostly Pantelleria uh, obsidian being used there and not at any of those other sites. So again, travel over water. There was certainly going directly from Pantelleria, more than 200 kilometers uh, to get to Gozo. We do not find in southern Sicily uh, that there were high percentages or even any Pantelleria obsidian making it to the southeastern part of Sicily. So they were not going in the same route at all the way Pantelleria obsidian was distributed to Ustica going to the western part of Sicily and then along the coastline, but simply that direct long distance kind of open water travel. The continuous occupation of Malta and the regular usage of obsidian from Lipari most strongly suggest the movement of other materials from Sicily that are not preserved or identified in the archaeological record. Nevertheless, there were clearly cultural differences between Malta and Sicily, as shown by the unique temples and burial chambers. Direct transport of obsidian from Pantelleria to Gozo and Malta also represents the maritime capability of such open water distances. We must remember that starting by 6000 BCE, there was the entire Neolithic package, with the capability of transporting domesticated sheep, goat, cattle, and pig to the central Mediterranean islands, the development of year-round settlements, and the introduction of pottery production, starting with the widespread cardial and pressed ware style. Obsidian would have been a small amount of the total materials on any vessel during the Neolithic, when population density was low and the economic and political organization quite different from what we see in the Bronze Age in the Aegean. One important aspect to point out is that the movement of obsidian mostly heads northwards and northwestwards. Uh, there is very little combination of trade, it appears, going from southern Italy into Albania or northwestern Greece. We have also seen that while great distances of open water travel, for example, from Pantelleria to southwestern Sicily, or from Malta to Sicily and to Pantelleria was possible, this was not part of their regular maritime activity. Coastal tra uh, travel uh, was definitely preferred for the entire Neolithic time period. By the late Neolithic, the evidence we have of major production and export of cores from Lipari and Sardinia is apparently quite different than for Pantelleria, which was not even regularly occupied at that time. While obsidian appears to have been used on Ustica and at Scorba in Malta in similar manners for thousands of years, the proportion from Pantelleria at the Brockdorf Circle is a unique case where its visual and physical properties may have been specifically selected. Further research is needed to address these questions, especially use where studies. The travel and use of obsidian involves multiple variables, which changed over time. On Lipari and in Sardinia, major production beyond local needs was established by the late Neolithic, a development along with increased cultural socio-complexity. We still need to integrate the obsidian data with other information, including studies of lithic technology, other materials, the contexts in which they are found, and the production and transport evidence for ceramics. The endpoints of the Chenopertoire are defined by obsidian sourcing, but the stages made in between represent potential choices in obsidian source and subsource selection and how that may have changed over time. I wish to thank my many colleagues and officials who provided access to, access to these obsidian finds and allowed this research. Thank you for being present for my presentation. I'm happy to answer questions you may have now or separately by email.